All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here for our fourth webinar this year, training for your hike this summer. Um, again, this is hosted by the Great Divide Trail Association. Um, and before we kind of start, we just want to um, acknowledge that the Great Divide Trail passes through the traditional indigenous territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony Nakoda, the Sutina, Cree, Shwetmik, Late Latene, Tanaha, and Sinaiaks and Metis nations. The Great Divide Trail is very committed towards reconciliation and educating people on the history of the trail, and we would love it if you would um, engage with that um, with us as well. Kind of starting off, I just want to give an overview of the Great Divide Trail Association if people are new here. So we are a volunteer based organization. We're a nonprofit. Um, every year we maintain hundreds of kilometers of trail. Um, we are the only organization advocating on behalf of what is Canada's longest through hike. Um, a couple ways you can help. Membership is the biggest way you can help us out. Um, they really help us out with grants. They help us with you know negotiating with Parks Canada to try to um, get the trail nationally recognized. Um, they help us basically in all the, the, the ways that we need to work with governing bodies. Um, another great way is volunteering. So that can be building trail or it can be doing one of um, belonging to one of the many subcommittees that um, the Great Divide Trail Association is built up on. So this is hosted by Outreach. My name is Austin. I'm in charge of Outreach on the Great Divide Trail Association. And lastly, if you just don't have time for any of that, another great way is donating. Um, we rely exclusively on grants and donations. Um, we make a little bit of money off of some merchandise we sell, but pretty much all of it is donation based. If you are interested in becoming a member, there are some pretty killer perks. Um, these are all the companies that we've partnered with for membership benefits. Um, Gear Trade, Durston, if you need a new sleeping bag, quilt, a tent, um, the cost of a membership will easily pay itself off um, just by getting the discount on a tent or something. Um, new for this year, we have, um, for people under 25, membership is free. So you can sign up on the website. We have a new membership portal, which is a lot cleaner than it's been in the past. So you'll get um, confirmation right away. And without further ado, I want to introduce you to Dr. Morgan Brosnahan. She's the owner of Blaze Physio. Um, she specializes in long distance hiking and she's a um, she's physio. She's currently on the Pacific Crest Trail. She kind of moves with the herd um, each year. Um, if you've heard anything about the PCT this year, it's a very interesting year. Um, anyway, I want to welcome Morgan and take it away. All right, thank you. Yeah, so we'll go through a little more in depth intro of just kind of what I do and um, the services that are available to you guys and just to the hiking community. And then we're really going to dive into training and some common injuries that I see with through hikers. So hopefully you can have just a little more awareness of what might be going on if you start to feel aches and pains and kind of where to go from there. Um, through hiking is interesting in the sense that you're in a lot of remote places when you get these problems. So um, having a kind of base to be able to self-treat and know, you know, what's more urgent and what can you walk through is um, important in terms of keeping you safe. So I'm going to share my screen here and we'll get a little slideshow going. Okay. And I do live in a van in these uh, journeys that I have. So I am using Starlink internet and every once in a while it will have a little skip. So if there's like a pause that I cut out, someone feel free to chime in and just tell me to repeat whatever I just said. Uh, it doesn't bother me at all. It happens somewhat frequently, but hopefully not today. <laughs> okay, so training and injury prevention. see. All right. So a little about me. I graduated from Chatham University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 2017 with my doctorate in physical therapy and promptly moved into a van so I could start doing travel therapy and kind of bouncing around the, the country and, you know, learning different skills in different settings. And then in 2019, I did the, the PCT uh, right before that I did the long trail in Vermont. So you could say I got the through hiking bug pretty good. Um, and then after that, I had realized that people were very injured 
and they weren't getting great help because um, in these small towns, a lot of the resources are like ERs and urgent cares, um, which are just not really places equipped to deal with um, major overuse injuries and things like that. So um, over the pandemic, I kind of figured out the idea for Blaze Physio to combine van living and, you know, my personal history of through hiking and kind of bring injury rehab to the trail. And so during the summer, I'm out on the trail. I'm actually right by the terminus at the moment. Um, and then I'll treat, you know, hikers all summer long. So part of my efforts after last season has been to start getting on the prevention side of things so I can see what injuries are common, putting that information out there and trying to get it to everybody whose goal is long distance hiking so you can be better prepared. And you will notice, let's see what this is clicking. There we go. You'll notice in my pictures that there is a golden retriever and her name is Honey. And she is my unhelpful assistant. <laughs> and she brings a lot of joy to people on trail and is just generally a cool little companion. So her job is just to um, give people free showers with her endless kisses and uh, give a little joy out here. So she won't be on the GDT because we won't be uh, headed up to Canada anytime soon. But if anybody swoops down to the PCT, you might get to meet Honey. And so a big part of what I do is uh, the virtual side of things. So telehealth, um, wellness consults, training consults, things like that. Um, so if you have any questions after this presentation, feel free to shoot me a message. I'm not licensed to do physical therapy in Canada, um, but sometimes there's still some things we can address or some local providers that I have in a cohort that I can refer you to that I know will understand your long distance goals. So kind of the outline for today, we're going to go over common injuries, um, elements of a good training plan, and how that relates to hiking specifically, and then um, some on-trail stretching and mobility things that you can do to help just kind of keep yourself feeling good and healthy. Um, Um, write them down, maybe sit on them and less something is just like, cannot wait, feel free to chime in. But um, ideally the flow goes a little bit better if we can save the questions till the end. There we go. So what can you do to prevent injury before trail? So figure out your footwear. That's one of the most important things. Um, you know, just from, from talking about the, the GDT, my impression is that boots are a little more common. It's a more rugged trail and that's fine. Um, I have a footwear presentation I didn't include in this because it's almost entirely about trail runners um, because that's really what we see on the PCT. So the biggest takeaways that relate to whether you're going to wear boots or sandals or trail runners or Crocs, whatever you're going to put on your feet, um, is when you go to the shoe stores, find three different shoes that might work for you, you know, pick your favorite and have that be the shoe you wear on trail, but know what some backups might be just in case you get out there and something happens, um, that might make that shoe not work for you. So having those backups in mind makes it so you can order things when there aren't gear stores readily available. Um, and then along with that, you know, I don't want to harp on weight and, and, you know, be kind of an ultralight weenie, but, <laughs> Um, just put some effort into your base weight, really scrutinize your gear, um, talk to other people who have hiked, do shakedown hikes. Um, just make sure your pack is really dialed in, no matter what the weight ends up being, knowing that you have it dialed in is a good peace of mind and any bit of weight that you can cut is going to help your joints and just generally do a little bit better time out there. And then the biggest thing is train. So I assume you're all here because you understand the importance of training and that training is a, you know, something that you should be considering for preparing for a through hike. So you're already ahead of the game in that sense. Um, but, you know, I've, I always kind of point this out that anytime someone posts in a general group of what should I do to train for my hike? It's usually met with the only hike training for hiking is, is hiking and you'll get in shape when you get out there. Don't worry about it. And and just kind of that response and <laughs> just physiologically, that's just not true. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do to give yourself an advantage. So you enjoy your trip. I don't, I wouldn't want to start a through hike totally out of shape and um, not enjoy my time in the woods because I'm, you know, gasping for air or things are hurting. So we'll go over how to build a routine, 
um, and just kind of give you the tools so you can feel confident about what you're doing with your training. And along with that, weight training is the unbiased champ in tendonitis prevention. And we're definitely gonna talk about tendonitis a bit because that is the most common injury. So let's go over a little bit of anatomy. So in terms of tendonitis being the most common injury, um, anterior tib tendonitis is probably the most common out of all of those. So this is the muscle that runs across your shin down diagonally across your foot and it controls the foot lowering motion. So think like the foot slap. So when your heel lands and your foot goes down to the ground to be flat, this muscle is basically the brakes to make sure that your foot doesn't just smack the ground. So one way to really reduce the risk of this injury is just to shorten your steps and walk a little slower. So it doesn't have to work so hard because you can see um, just seeing the anatomy of it is sometimes helpful because look how small of a muscle it is. And then think about tens of thousands of steps. If we can do anything to reduce how hard that little muscle has to work, that's going to be in your advantage. And then additionally, we want to strengthen that muscle up. So between those two things, you can likely prevent the most common hiking injury, which is anterior tib tendonitis. And then on the other side of the ankle, you have your Achilles. Most people are pretty well versed in the Achilles. It's a common area that, you know, people have felt little bits of pain through different activities. Um, it's the back of the heel. It kind of extends down. It doesn't go under the foot. If it goes under the foot, then that's typically more of a plantar fascia or a fat pad issue. But if it's on the back side of the heel, you're likely dealing with the Achilles anywhere from there to a few inches up. So if the Achilles is the issue and you're wearing a zero drop shoe, that would be my first suspicion. Um, but a lot of times it comes down to limited ankle mobility, which we'll definitely get into some of the ramifications of limited ankle mobility. And then in the group of calf muscles, you also have your posterior tib. And I marked them X's instead of just showing where the muscle goes, because these are the two points that usually hurt. So it's that inside of the ankle, kind of just behind or above the, the bone where it bumps out and then down on the foot, especially where the bone sticks out on the foot. So your navicular bone that kind of, when you run your fingers, you feel a bump. Um, those two spots, if those are tender, it's likely the posterior tib. Um, and this is a pretty small muscle and it typically is cranky on people with flatter feet um, who tend to overpronate um, or who have, again, really stiff ankles. So instead of being able to roll through, you're rolling through the middle of your foot. So if any of those things feel like they apply to you, um, paying a special attention to strengthening up the posterior tib may be beneficial in your training efforts. Um, and we'll go through some exercises that will relate to that. So in general, tendonitis is when the load exceeds the capacity of the tendon. And the higher your capacity is through training and through proper rest and um, recovery, the harder it is for you to get injured. So the more you do ahead of time, the less likely your hike is to trigger a tendonitis. Um, the good news about tendonitis is although it can be quite painful, the only thing that actually heals a tendon if a tendon does get flared up is load. So it's sort of that fine line of what brought it on was too much load, but the treatment for it is decreasing the load, but continuing to load it. Cause that's the only way we'll get the structural changes to make the tendon back to increasing the capacity and being above the line of injury. So if you feel pain on a tendon, um, so if you're looking at your anatomy and you're going, okay, this pain is directly on a tendon, chances are it is a tendonitis or a tendinopathy is what we say more often. And the important things to know are it's okay if you have a little pain, like zero to three out of 10, typically you can keep going. You want to look at things to decrease the load, like getting the joint more mobile, maybe tape, shortening your stride, um, just different offloading techniques. But if the pain is getting above a five out of 10, you're going to risk continuing to perpetuate the injury and making things worse. So if you're up in that kind of territory above five out of 10 pain on a tendon, you need to start planning rest breaks, maybe you take a trail zero, um, whatever you can do to calm it down and start to gradually reload it. So plantar fascia. So I mentioned that with the Achilles, it's the backside of the foot. 
Um, the plantar fascia is this red part underneath the foot. So it extends up towards the toes. Typically, if you have plantar fasciitis, it's going to hurt first thing in the morning. It'll warm up a little bit and then be pretty cranky by the end of the day. Um, there is ways to manage plantar fasciitis on trail. It's a little more in depth than the tendon stuff. So we won't get into all of it. That's kind of its own, own beast. Um, but uh, some quick things are just keeping your calves stretched out, rolling out the bottom of your foot, um, doing some of the ankle mobility drills, which we'll go over. And um, sometimes changing your footwear can all help reduce the load. There is also a tape technique that um, I have a clip on YouTube for. So if you deal with plantar fasciitis, maybe tuck a little note to yourself to maybe try that tape technique in a pinch and see if it helps you you know, get out, get off trail or get to the next stop. So last injury to kind of touch on is shin splints. So I'm mostly just going to talk about the foot and ankle injuries and then get into the training um, just because these are the most common. Um, but we could do a whole hour and a half on just injuries alone and, you know, not run out of things to talk about. So um, one thing I want to point out with shin splints is they are commonly misdiagnosed when they're self-diagnosed. Um, a lot of times it's actually anterior or posterior tib tendonitis, which is better news typically. So we know that load heals a tendon. So when we can offload it and continue to walk, we hit that sweet spot and generally can keep pushing through it. True shin splints have increased uh, swelling, tenderness on the bone, um, pain when lifting the foot. And um, generally they have pitting edema. So when you press your fingers down and you lift up, it will leave a dent in the skin that stays there for more than a few seconds. So the thing about shin splints that you wanna pay attention to is if the pain is more than three finger widths, it's not as likely to be a fracture. If it's really targeted where you put a finger down and it hurts here and it only hurts here, um, you may wanna to get to somewhere where you can get some x-rays. Um, a lot of times it takes a week or so of rest to calm this down, managing the swelling, changing your gait, looking at shoes. This injury tends to be a little more involved. Um, and one thing that's not written here is if you ever have a situation where your leg swells up, you start to feel numbness, tingling, um, you're starting to lose control of your foot, it starts to kind of change colors. Um, that can be something called compartment syndrome, which is basically a really extreme shin splint where you're getting bleeding into the compartment and it is an emergency. So if that happens and you're on trail, that would be an SOS level injury. That's about the only um, overuse injury that would warrant getting immediate help because you have about six hours to, you know, get a fasciotomy and release that pressure without having permanent damage. That's not to scare you because it's not that common, um, but signs of it typically pop up before it gets there. So kind of knowing what those symptoms may be helps you get off trail without having to go, you know, quickly off trail in an emergency sense. And if it, you know, you got in a bind where it got there, you should know what those symptoms are, just like, you know, any other symptoms of like hypothermia and altitude sickness, all of those other things. So just as important there as a little side note. For this ankle mobility. So for the ankle mobility drill, um, so I've kind of mentioned a few times that stiffness in the ankle is oftentimes a precursor to a lot of those injuries. So this is one exercise I wanted to make sure that you see, and you can even drop down and try it while we're going through this presentation. As a PT, it's uh, always fun to me if during a hour long talk, if I can get you moving some. So if you wanna set up in this half kneel position and kind of go through this as we do it, um, you'll just kind of get a taste of it, but this is something I give for a lot of injuries to help increase that ankle mobility and release those stressors. Drill, we're going to be working on increasing your dorsiflexion and the ability of your talus to roll backward towards your tibia. So this is often a place that gets restricted and that's why we focus on it the most. You're going to pretend that there's a center point in the middle of your kneecap and then you're going to lunge forward, bringing your knee over your toe as far as you can. And when your heel first starts to lift up, that's your end point. And as you go forward, I want you to put that center point towards your big toe and then press down at your end point. So straight down over the heel and then come back. And then the next time, go over your second toe. Go forward towards the second toe. Go over and back. Now third toe. And on until you get to your last toe. 
And you're just gonna rock back and forth like that at those different angles for about a minute. All right. And I just noticed in this title, because I just added this slide a little bit ago, uh, one thing these injuries all have in common, not one this. Um, so let's move on to stress fractures. So stress fractures, just want to give you common symptoms and then move on from these. Um, it, training, if you need any more motivation to train than you already have, preventing stress fractures is a huge one. Your bones get stronger based on the stress that is put on them. So exercise and progressively loading helps to increase that bone strength and resiliency. So you are less likely to get fractures if you have trained beforehand. Um, and the risk factors for a fracture include like overly ramping up your activity out of nowhere. So you're not as likely to have that big ramp up if you've been training beforehand. But you'll know to be a little bit suspicious of a stress fracture if you have pain at rest, um, pain that's getting progressively worse, like just, you know, more frequent, more intense. It just keeps getting worse and worse. There's no ebb and flow. It's just getting worse. Um, and it's pinpoint tender. So like we talked about shin splints, if it's just one spot that you poke and that hurts, um, you got to be a little more suspicious of that, especially if you notice any bruising, night pain, or if it hurts just when you bear weight. And risk factors include um, rapid weight loss. So making sure your, your diet is dialed in on trail is important. You don't want to just drop a bunch of weight really fast, or you do start to lose some bone strength. Um, along with that is something called REDS, which is includes the loss of a menstrual cycle, which is a sign that you're not getting enough um, calories in. So if you do lose your menstrual cycle, you want to try to increase your calories. Um, consult a professional if that really keeps hanging on because you don't want to get those imbalances. Um, and wearing overly worn out shoes is a soapbox I will live and die on. It is not worth taking your shoes to the bitter end because it ends up costing you more in the long run um, if you end up with an injury because you didn't change out your shoes more often. And over pronation or supination, if you're noticing you land on the inside or your outside of your foot, that's something you might want to address um, either with, you know, you can YouTube it, how to correct it, or I would work with a PT personally, um, but trying to get that balanced out with either your footwear, your insoles, and, and ideally just strengthening up your foot and ankles. Um, traumas, so anything can happen on trail, you know, you can have a weird step, fall off a rock, things like that. Um, that could certainly lead to a fracture. And then overstriding. So kind of already touched on it with the taking shorter, slower steps, but if you're landing way out in front of you and having a really hard heel strike, you are more likely to get fractures um, from all of that stress going up the bone. So just reeling it in a little bit will help reduce that. So on to training, that's just kind of the injury portion of things, just to give you a general overview of things to look out for. Um, so you can be a little more efficient at uh, kind of picking out what might be wrong and finding appropriate treatment. Um, so just like you save money for a through hike, you should train. Um, I consider it like insurance. So you're spending all the money on gear. You're taking the time off work. You're doing all the things to get your life in order to be out here. Um, the least you could do is train a bit. So that way you enjoy your time and you're less likely to have an injury. And with training, progressive overload is very important. So um, you shouldn't be lifting the same weights for the rest of your life. Um, about every couple of weeks, you should see pound increases or reps, sets, um, any of those things should be increasing. That's how you know you're getting a progressive overload. And simple is effective. So we'll go through kind of exercises to pick from and how to write a routine but it doesn't have to be overly complicated. The best exercise routine is just one you're gonna to stick to and that covers compound movements across the whole body. So even if you can only get 20 minutes a day, a few times a week, that is much better than nothing in terms of injury prevention and just being ready for trail. Um, along with that, you do not need to be able to hike 30 miles a day when you first come to the trail. Um, ideally you can hike at least 10 to 15 fairly comfortably. That's kind of a rule of thumb with most through hikes, but, um, depending on the trail you're doing, sometimes you can get away with a little less. It's my impression of the GDT that it is more remote. So I think 10 to 15 is probably a good starting point because you don't have, um, as easy of town access to be taking breaks and getting off trail. So elements of a good training plan. 
this may be obvious, you wanna get some cardio. So what you're doing is largely a cardio activity. So hiking, running, walking, um, you're basically just trying to get your body used to longer spells of time on your feet. So it's not a shock when you're walking 10 plus hours a day. And this is kind of how I would rank the hierarchy of cardio for hikers. So obviously if you can get out with your backpack and progress your mileage and your pack weight, that's great. We don't all live in places that have access to trails um, or depending on when your start date is for a hike, sometimes you're coming out of the dead of winter. So when that's not an option, you can kind of go down this list and anything on this list is sufficient to be giving you some cardio. I just kind of rank them in what I would think would be the most helpful. Um, so if you have a gym where you can get a stair stepper or any kind of like stadium steps where you can be doing repeat stairs up and down, I do kind of like stadium steps or just staircases a little better than the stair stepper because you can get the downhill on the steps as well. Um, and a lot of people have trouble with going downhill on trail because their knees aren't ready for that kind of eccentric movement. So that's something that can be helpful. And then along with that, running hills um, or hiking with a pack up hills, incline treadmill, hit workouts, um, all of those things are all very good too. Um, the key is that you're just going to at least do something for your cardio. When it comes to how to program your cardio, you want to build up in duration. So kind of get your baseline. Maybe it's 10 minutes of any of those cardio activities to start, and then you can start by adding like a minute each time until you can't quite keep up with that and then try adding it about every other time or every week. Um, Cause in the beginning you can progress your duration a bit faster. Um, and then there gets to be a point where it kind of levels off and you, you progress a little bit slower cause you get to a certain point where it's objectively a lot harder. And when you're calculating your intensities, if you have any way to monitor your heart rate. So like a Apple watch, a Fitbit, anything like that, um, you're going for 40 to 60% of your max heart rate for the bulk of your cardio activity. So if you take someone who is 29, you do 220 minus their age, and you'd come up with 196 as the max heart rate, take the percentage of 40 to 60%, and that's going to give you 78 to 117 beats per minute. Um, and then you want to get some intervals of high intensity, about one to five minutes per 20 minutes of cardio. So think when you're climbing a hill, your heart rate really gets up when you're backpacking, you're kind of trying to mimic that with your cardio training. And at that point, we're going for 70 to 90% of your max heart rate. If you don't have a way to monitor your heart rate, you can use the RPE chart, so the rate of perceived exertion. And in this case, we would be going for the four to six RPE with intervals up to nine. Um, so you can see the descriptors here, you're at a four to six, you are um, breathing heavy, you can hold a short conversation, you're still kind of comfortable, but it's, it's a challenge. So you know you can't do this all day, um, but it, it's certainly a workout. And then when you get up towards the nine, this is where you, you don't want to talk, you know, you're sprinting, like you're running from something like that kind of intensity. Um, and 10 is where you, you literally can't do anything harder than what you're currently doing. We don't go to 10 that often. You may get a quick blip of a 10 when you're doing a high intensity interval, but um, generally this like four to nine area is where we get the most gains. So resistance training. Um, a lot of times hikers are not that into resistance training or they're just not familiar with it. And that's one goal I have is to just kind of um, like get the boogeyman away from it. So it's make it less intimidating, make it a little more appealing and show that you don't need a lot of equipment to get into resistance training. And it is so good for your tendons and your bones um, that if you can incorporate even a day of it, you're gonna see some benefits. Um, so we'll go into how to like properly program the dosage of it. But the big thing is you wanna focus on compound movements and progressively overload them. I really recommend tracking your movements and the weights to make sure that you are in fact increasing things because sometimes it can be easy to get in a habit and not really sure what your last uh, resistance was and not know where to go from there. And then taking rest breaks. So one to two days a week can be focused on just mobility training or just not doing anything and learning how to recover. Um, if you get used to seeing what your body feels like after a day or two of recovery and you get back at it, 
and learning how to maximize recovery days, it's going to serve you when you're through hiking because you're going to see the value of a zero, which if you're new to hiking in general, zero is just hiking zero miles that day. So a day off. Um, but when you see the value of a zero, you start to know when you need it and you're more likely to take them and prioritize them instead of just constantly going in. Well, we only did 10 miles today as if that's like, you know, almost a zero. Um, so that should be good because in reality, no workout plan is, is normal to have no rest days. Um, but something happens to our brains on through hikes and we go, you know, two, three weeks without taking a day off, um, just because there's that forward mentality. Um, and it does start to catch up with us at some point. So if you're really in tune from your training with the value of rest days, you are more likely to prioritize them when you get on trail and that will help you with injuries. So past injuries are the best predictor of future injuries. So because of that, no one has the same training needs and no one has the same starting point. So what somebody else might be doing to prepare for trail may be a lot more than what you're doing, but that doesn't mean you won't be successful. Everybody is different and we all benefit from functional strength, endurance and mobility. Um, and we all just have different modes and modifications to get there. If you have past injuries, those may be the areas you want to prioritize the most. So that way you are interrupting that predictor of future injuries. And equipment wise, just wanted to point out that there is a wide range of access. So some people will have full gyms, just a kettlebell, some dumbbells, resistance bands. You can even just use an odd object like loading up your pack and get a pretty good uh, resistance workout in. It can be accessible no matter what level of equipment you have. So in terms of dosage, so now we'll get into how to schedule things. So um, if you have six days a week, I would opt for either three days of cardio and three days of lifting or four days of cardio and two days of lifting. I would never do less than two days of lifting, ideally, if you are able to give more than um, four days to your training. So that was, that's how I'd kind of prioritize it with just this list. So you can kind of see what would work best for you. Um, keep in mind, they don't have to be a full hour. So if you're looking at this one, I don't have that kind of time. Um, even if you did the three days of cardio, three days of lifting, and they were all 20 minute workouts, that would still be beneficial over time, as opposed to just doing one or two days a week that are a little longer. So if you are going to do um, less than three days of resistance training, full body programming is the best way to target things. So isolating things by muscle group, um, like by small muscles is fine if you're able to lift more often in the week. Um, but when you only have so many days to work with, you want to go for compound movements that encompass the six functional movements. So something that's a pushing movement, a pulling movement, a squat, a deadlift, a carry, and a step. Um, and we'll go through some examples of those later. And then in addition to that, you're just going to pick three to five accessory movements. And I'm going to give you a huge list of all of these that with some videos you can access, um, just so you can kind of pull from it and see what fits your needs. And just a note on plyometrics. So it's basically where cardio meets functional movement. So, you know, this is cardio without running, walking, or hiking. These are things like jumping rope, uh, mountain climbers, jumping jacks, box jumps, frog jumps, all of those kinds of things. Um, and these are really good, especially if you don't have access to a lot of weight, because this is going to give you um, that heavier resistance and reduce um, your risk of fractures, help with tendons. Um, tendons to be at their full capacity need to be able to store energy and release it, like in plyometric movements. So oftentimes that's the part that goes um, kind of skipped over in terms of like tendon rehab, especially, but also in terms of tendon prevention. And you can program plyometrics with HIIT training. Um, and this is again, good for busy people with time constraints. So this slide is just to kind of break down some timer intervals you can use. So, you know, you can do a one-to-one -one work rest, two-to-one, three-to-one. And then these are examples of some timers you can use. So like 60 seconds on, 60 seconds off and so forth. Um, so you find the one that fits your fitness level, try to do 10 to 20 minutes, pick a few from the plyometric list and just kind of go for it. 
you can use, there's a free timer. Um, if you are interested in this and you want to write down smart wad timer, so W O D it's free and it has all kinds of different timers already preset. You can pick your movements, hit the timer, and then, you know, get in a hit workout that way and know that you are doing your bones and tendons a service. So if you do have access to weights and you're able to do resistance training, you're gonna to wanna to emphasize single leg and compound movements. And we've talked about progressive overload and this is kind of a breakdown of how to do that. So if you find a weight that's challenging to do eight to 10 reps, you're gonna stick with that weight until you can do 15 reps with that weight. So say you do 20 pounds for lunges and you can only do eight to 10 reps, you stay with 20 until you're able to bump the reps up over time to 15 for three to four sets. And then once you get there, you're gonna increase the weight again until you find one that's challenging for eight to 10 reps and repeat that and track it. So that's a really simplified way of doing progressive overload. There are certainly other ways, but um, this will work. This will make sure that you're progressing over time and it's a simple formula to get you started. So if you have less equipment, such as like just one kettlebell, smaller weights or bands, um, in this case, we would do higher reps more towards fatigue. So sometimes these can be upward of 30 plus reps. Um, the goal here is to get to the point where it feels like you couldn't really do three more reps. So that's the kind of fatigue you want to have in the muscle when you do have light weight. And it can be as effective as heavier weights for building muscle and strength. Um, and one perk is it is a little bit related to the endurance needed of the high repetition load of through hiking. So sometimes even mixing in lighter weights at high reps is a nice way to vary things and kind of get your body ready. Um, heel raises would be a good example of this. So doing high reps of heel raises is directly related to the need of walking hundreds of miles. So we kind of mentioned this, the, the goal is to feel tired by the last three reps. Um, you shouldn't be failing, but you should feel like you don't want to do three more. And you want to hit four sets per, per pertinent muscle group per week. Um, so just to make it simple, let's think of the quads. So, you know, the front of your thighs and you want at least four sets of an exercise that's going to target that. So say you're going to lift two days a week and you're going to pick lunges and step ups. And those are going to be your two quad exercises. You would just want to do two sets on the first day of lunges and then two sets on the second day of step ups. You can do more if you feel you can do more. This is just the minimum value to make sure that you're getting the gains that you need. The four sets per muscle group per week has kind of been found in our research to be the sweet spot of making sure you're making gains and you're not losing anything by going too long with not enough. So here's just an example of a program you could do, kind of incorporates everything we talked about, um, just a Sunday through Friday routine. Um, you could vary the days here, put the rest in different spots. Um, and a note that if you do combine things and you wanna do cardio and resistance on the same day, um, ideally you can do the cardio after the resistance training. So it's okay to do a little cardio workout that's not exhaustive to just get warmed up before lifting. But if you're gonna go like 30 minutes on the stair climber, um, ideally you'll do your resistance training before that. So that way you're not exhausted and you can lift sufficient weight to get the impacts. So the six functional movements workout, um, here's some examples. So again, we've got our squat. So a bunch of different squat variations, step ups, things like that, or not step ups, um, single legs, sit to stands and a hinge variation, which is just bending forward at the hips. So getting the hamstrings and the glutes. So you got variations of mostly deadlifts. Um, the single leg deadlift is a personal favorite of mine for hikers. It just helps so many things. I could go on and on about that one. Um, and then steps. So step ups, lunges, anything where it's like a split stance is a step movement and push. So you can do some push ups. Um, I always joke that these are the ones you tell yourself you'll do on trail, but you won't. Um, you know, that's always the dream. You're going to get out there and get in such great shape while you're hiking. And you're even going to do push-ups at night. So when you're done, you're just going to have this well-rounded fitness body of a, of a goddess. And then 
nobody does push-ups at the end of the day or nobody that I know <laughs> and we all end up with the hiker noodle arms in the end but um, before trail if you can work on the push-ups it's good for the core and if you can do overhead presses it's going to help with the the strength in the shoulders to carry the pack um, and thrusters are a personal favorite for me where you do a squat and you stand up and do an overhead press from there because you combine legs and arms there and that's that's nice for hiking um, pulling motion so any kind of rows um, are essentially the pulling things those are all going to also help with the upper back and your low back getting you strong for um, holding your pack all day long and a carry so you are going to be carrying weight that's that's really specific to um, through hiking so when you are training a carry, you are inevitably going to get better at hiking. So you're, you're walking with the weight in different positions. You can have it down at your sides. You can hold it up. Um, there's all kinds of different farmers carry variations, but, um, and even just like walking with your pack can be counting for your carry exercise if you need to. Um, but this is really great for that kind of mid back pain that people get when they put their pack on and it kind of comes on towards the middle to the end of the day and, and it feels like they just can't quite move their shoulder enough to get that pain to go away that knot. Um, this kind of training helps with that. And then some examples of accessory exercises. So uh, heel raises are huge. Um, anything with the foot and ankle, um, the shoulders, doing some lateral raises, bands. Um, again, I'll give you a whole list of some accessory stuff you can get into, but um, the big takeaway is prioritize the big six functional movements and then tack on the accessories from there. If we're just doing heel raises, but not doing squats, um, you're kind of missing the big picture by looking a little bit too specific, unless you've got an injury rehab routine that you're working on. But um, ideally for training purposes, we're keeping it big and then working small, not the other way around. And just a shout out to the Nordic hamstring curls um, because hamstring uh, tightness and strains and um, fatigue, all of that on trail is pretty common. Um, but people aren't really great at training their hamstrings. We pretty much have the quads down, but the hamstrings go a little underdeveloped. Um, and now there is a new product called the Nordic bar <clears throat> and it, you can get it on Amazon. It looks kind of like this. It's not this exactly, but it goes under a door. Um, and it lets you do that movement where you slowly fall forward. Um, sometimes this is better if you have a pole in front of you to help lower yourself down to make it more accessible in the beginning. Um, but there's lots of YouTube videos on this one for the Nordic hamstring curl. But if this is something accessible to you, this is a really great posterior chain exercise. So I wanted to give it its kind of own slide. Five minutes. All right, and then this next one, uh, I'm gonna get you moving a little bit more. So if you've got your shoes on, go ahead and take them off. Um, and we're gonna just do a toe yoga series. So this is one that I like to call a casual exercise because you can be doing it at work. You can be doing it when you are just lounging. watch this video and you can give it a shot. Five moves to help strengthen up your feet before your next through hike. First, we have toe yoga. So you're lifting your big toe and putting the other four down, going back and forth until you start to feel some fatigue in the foot. Next up, we got curl and spread. So you're curling all your toes and then trying to spread them out as best you can. This one's pretty hard for people. You're trying to move your big toe in and out. That's going to get the muscle that's right back around your heel where plantar fasciitis tends to be a problem. Short foot is really good for strengthening up the arch. You should be able to lift your toes up at any point in this movement so you're not using them for the movement. After you get the pull down, then you're going to rock forward onto your toes to give it a little eccentric twist. All right. So that's when you can practice kind of casually, just getting your feet moving um, goes a long way for common foot pains just to get those intrinsic foot muscles a bit stronger. Um, so that's fun to do. And then more accessory movements, you've got some stuff for the hips. I'm going to show you a video of how you might take accessory movements and put them in a circuit, especially as the hips are related. 
um, but all kinds of examples of things that you can do to target the hips and the hip rotators. Um, an early injury that people get often on trail is IT band pain in the side of the knee, which is actually a hip problem that manifests in the knee. So um, having weakness in the hips causes a hip drop and pain to go down that IT band, zings people right in the side of the knee. It feels like an ice pick, um, really painful, pretty tough to walk through, um, usually recoverable while on trail with some days off and some other things. But um, if you can avoid it by having stronger hips, then it's definitely worth avoiding. Try this circuit to work on hip muscles that often go overlooked. These Copenhagen planks are really good for the adductor muscles and help a lot with anterior hip pain. Next we'll work the hip flexors. So I'm sitting on a yoga block to accommodate my tighter hamstrings. And then you're just lifting that leg up and over an obstacle. So that way you get it up high enough and trying to just maintain a neutral spine throughout. Okay, last one here, we're going to put a band around your feet. That just gets the TFL muscle a little better. And we're going to add a hurdle with it. So you're stepping up and over like you're stepping over top of an obstacle. This is going to get the hip flexors involved, and it's a really great one for hikers. All right. So, sorry, a little jump scare there. Um, I forgot that was the next slide, but <laughs> there is, uh, that's an example of like accessory work for a hip, right? So those aren't big compound movements like squats and step ups, um, but those are targeting three different smaller muscle groups, put them in a circuit, knock them all out. And you're working three areas that are largely um, undertrained, but also are big contributors to being uh, preventing injuries. So just giving you ideas of what it can look like, how to program these things and the movements that you might prioritize. Um, and then last is stretching and mobility. So um, the difference between a stretch and a mobilization is that a mobilization is gonna target the bones. So think the ankle joint when we were looking at the half kneel, knee over toe, um, there's not a big stretch happening in the muscles there, right? Like when you do that, you don't really feel it in the calf, maybe a little bit down low, but um, generally you feel kind of more in the ankle. And that's because we're trying to get the bones to move past each other better. We're trying to get mobility in the bones. Um, stretching is going to actually take the muscle and put it in its longest length and stretch the muscle. So ideally a combination of both on trail is helpful for different reasons. Um, but when you are looking at when to do these things. Mobility work is best done when it's followed by movement or exercise. So like on trail, you would do it periodically throughout the day. So I usually have people do the ankle mobility thing um, like every two hours. So then they follow it with continued walking and reinforce that mobility. Stretching tends to be more relaxing and kind of just help with a little bit of pain relief sometimes. So um, at the end of the day, at the end of a workout, um, at lunchtime, when you're taking a longer break, those are kind of better times to stretch. And then in the beginning of the day or the beginning of a workout, a dynamic warm up that gets your heart rate up, um, but is not exhaustive, where you go through full range of motion, like, like deep squats, lunges, jumping jacks, reaching overhead, um, reaching down to the floor, those things are going to be better for your warm up. And then at lunch, um, you can mix in mobility if you want. You can also just do a little bit of stretching. Depends how long you're going to do the lunch break for. Um, but when it comes to flexibility, um, stretching at that happens at lunch is more likely to increase your flexibility than stretching before you sleep. Um, so it depends what your goal is, because if you want to just relax and wind down and, and fall asleep easier, then stretching at night may be the move. Um, but you will be laying still then for the next eight to 12 hours. So a one minute hamstring stretch is hard to counteract laying in a cocoon for the next 12 hours in terms of how loose things are gonna feel. Um, but if it gets you to sleep, sleep is so important for recovery and injury prevention that um, you know if that's the best time of day to stretch for you, then that's perfect. So we'll look at an example of an on-trail stretching routine. You can do this one if you want to, if you wanna move again. Um, it's a little bit sped up just so that way it can get a lot of movements in, but you could probably keep up. Simple stretching routine for through hikers at the end of the day.
and this part works in mobility. So this is mobility of the thoracic spine rather than a stretch. Our backs get kind of stiff holding a pack all day. So, that, Simple stretch. that last one was a sciatic nerve glide, um, which is different than all of those things. So, just a quick note on that that um, if you have nerve tension and you have a history of nerve tension, um, understanding nerve glides and working those in can be really helpful to help reduce like numbness in the feet, um, tingling, things like that. Um, if you get nerve pains, that's something to look into or talk with a PT about um, and see if that would be a good thing for you to work in. Um, for everybody, though, proactively, as long as you're not having symptoms with the nerve glide, that last move is very helpful. And then, again, the best way to improve flexibility is to do the resistance training through the full range. So if you do a loaded squat all the way down, um, you're more likely to get bigger range and flexibility in your hips than if you just sit and pigeon all day, um, which is the hip stretch. So um, reinforcing your mobility work with exercise through that range, loading it up. Um, example, also being a heel raise off the edge of a step, that's going to loosen your calf muscles up more than any amount of just calf stretching. So here is a few examples of um, just body weight exercises um, where you're using uh, just your body or a resistance band. Um, I'm going to give you a, lit, a website with an access code so you can get all these videos. And then I have a growing playlist on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. Um, all these videos were kind of pulled from those different platforms. And so you can go through those and kind of find some other videos of training ideas to help make your program. So this is the big list. So this URL at medbridgego.com, um, this access code and you can punch this in and then all of these on this list, it'll give you videos. So you can just kind of page through it and learn some new things um, with some instructions. So you can have kind of a master list to pull from. So in closing, the best training plan is one that you're gonna do. So um, don't settle for not doing anything because it feels like you can't do everything. Um, sometimes analysis paralysis can take over whenever we're trying to figure out training plans and uh, you sit down and you write things with your best intentions and before you know it you've given yourself three hours a day of training and you don't know where to start and it's overwhelming and you just kind of throw your hands up and don't do anything. Um, so even if you're just getting 20 minutes a day or just picking those six functional things and going with those um, Anything is going to help reduce your risk of injury, get your body ready, and, and more importantly, just make sure you enjoy your hike. Um, and the nice thing is about every two to four weeks, there's a pretty noticeable trade-off um, in terms of improving your strength, your endurance, um, even your mood and your energy levels, things like that. So if you can just stick with it and tell yourself two weeks at a time, um, you start to feel those little boosts in kind of morale and those improvements, and that kind of helps keep you going. So getting things specific is still important. Um, these things all mimic hiking, but it is not actual hiking. Um, so if you can get any activity where you are wearing your loaded pack, spending long hours on your feet, that's going to also help supplement um, all your fitness training to help make sure that your body is ready for just the unique demands of walking all day, being on your feet and carrying something because it is exhausting um, and sort of bracing yourself for that is helpful, but there is going to be a transition no matter what you do to prepare. And that's why I really recommend going for less mileage than you think you're capable of in the beginning um, while your body kind of adapts to the new environment. So this is just a little routine, um, just to give an example of movements you can do that are covering the functional six movements and it's just using a loaded pack. So I assume you all have packs that you can load up either with your gear or water jugs or you name it. 
Um, you can go through a routine like this, know you're covering all the big muscle groups and you don't have to buy any new equipment. So all that to say, um, if you feel like you need more guidance, um, I do have a pre-hike training class um, series and it's just basically 20 classes. Eventually there'll be a bonus five whenever I get uh, time on trail here to add those five, but right now it's just 20. Um, you can have the whole series, individual classes, um, whatever helps you most get started. So if you just need an example workout and you want to pick one from the list, they are $10 a workout. So um, my goal is to make it accessible. And if you have questions, you can shoot me emails. Um, no thing is too small if you just need a little guidance. And then if you are thinking that um, doing one-on-one -on -one training would be helpful for you. I don't do one-on-one -on -one training during the hiking season, so I can be free to um, help injured hikers on, on trail. Um, but I do work closely with Lee from Trailside Fitness. I, I see his clients for any injuries that pop up. Um, and he is, he is also a through hiker and a personal trainer, and he does some great stuff. So if you're thinking, I just want to work with someone that's just going to tell me what to do, I get it, this is important. Um, you might shoot him an email, and he's enrolling people right now. So um, he's a good resource. And then in that same note, um, Backcountry Foodie is a through hiker and a dietitian, and she also is worth checking out. Um, she has a lot of resources on how to optimize your, your food. And um, she also works uh, closely with me and Lee because all of us just have the same goal to help make people enjoy their hikes, be physically and uh, mentally ready and just enjoy these journeys that are so impactful. Um, this is just my information. I'm just pretty much Blaze Physio everywhere you look. So all the social medias, um, I forgot to add YouTube, but that one's on there and uh, website blazephysio.com. So however you want to get a hold of me, if you can, feel free to reach out. And now we can open it to questions with a final video of Honey doing the snaggle lip face. Awesome. Thanks a bunch. That was super helpful. I went through a like a training plan before my Great Divide Trail hike, and this was way more substantial. I feel like if I had done this plan, I would have had a better time. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, either pop them in the chat or feel free to come off mute. There we go. Okay. It looks like I froze for a second. So if anybody asked anything in the last 10 seconds, I didn't hear it. <laughs> Hannah has one on shoes. You mentioned wearing old shoes slash insoles. What's a good measure to change out shoes? And what about changing out insoles? Sure. That's a good question. So um, I do a video on YouTube that shows you how to um, pick up defects in your shoes. Um, but it's basically just a few things like um, I'm just wearing slippers. So these aren't the, great, the greatest, but uh, things like the brake test where you do this and then it shouldn't be real bendy. Um, like there should be some stability. You shouldn't be able to just roll your shoe up in a ball like this. Um, and then also keeping your hands in the same position. You can do the twist test. And there should be most of the motion coming from um, the forefoot, not the midfoot. You want stability there. And then just kind of looking at like the wrinkles on the side of the shoe, making sure there's not big rips, um, like it's not coming apart at the seams where it connects to the foam. Um, and this is on the video, so you can reference it too. But um, typically mileage wise, 500 is uh, like the max optimistic goal for shoes. Um, sometimes boots will last a little bit longer, but um, not that often. Uh, typically five would be my cutoff. And if you're having any foot or ankle pains after three, uh, 300, I would replace your shoes. Um, and then insoles can sometimes last twice as long as your shoes. And um, uh, like cork insoles, like sole is an insole that I tend to like. Um, they tend to last a little bit longer, more like three uh, pairs of shoes. So um, you can kind of get a little more life out of the insoles than the shoe itself. Awesome. And I just put um, her YouTube channel here in the chat if people are interested. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, now I see the chat. Oh, thanks, guys. This is nice. <laughs> um, so advice for senior hikers. Um, 
I would say for senior hikers, just knowing that um, recovery is a little bit slower with age. So prioritizing breaks through the day, um, a little more mobility work on your breaks, um, definitely dialing in things that can enhance your recovery. So really looking into the nutrition. Um, just with age, it gets a little harder to get away with living on gummy worms and M&Ms. So um, making sure you're getting some nutrients in, especially protein. Um, protein is the thing that most hikers are lacking and can be, um, a part of not healing fast and recovering fast from injuries. So you're, you're aiming ideally for about your body weight in grams. So if you weigh 150 pounds, you would want to try to get 150 grams of protein. Um, and for older people, sometimes even a little more than that. So it can be tough to find those protein sources on trail. And that's where I definitely would recommend checking out backcountry foodies recipes she does a lot of like meal replacement shakes and things that help when you don't have the appetite to be kind of shoving down that much protein. And there's only so much beef jerky that anybody wants to eat. So um, she can give you some ideas there. Are there extra tails? Um, there are other ankle mobility exercises. Um, I am planning to put out like a guide to ankle mobility. I just haven't had the time, <laughs> but it is on the top of my content list. So when that's up, um, it'll be on YouTube or my website, uh, somewhere where it's apparent that it's available, but I'm working on a whole through hikers guide to various injuries, to various like mobility issues. Um, so it's kind of a, allows you to have a help yourself option since, especially cause like the GDT, I can't do a consult with you on trail if you're injured. Um, just because I can't extend uh, medical services to Canada. Um, but if I can have these help yourself things, you can kind of pick the one that works best for you. And that's sort of the workaround in that sense. Yeah, you can do kind of preemptive care, hey, because it's more considered training rather than rehabilitation. Yeah, like if I can work with someone who, like if you have like a history of an injury and you want to just like train to prevent it and train around it, we can do that. But um, if you have an acute injury that needs a diagnosis, um, technically that is physical therapy. So that would be uh, using a license that I can't get in Canada unless I got an international, but that's really complicated. And I would move to Canada, whoever wrote that. Dave, I, I absolutely would move to Canada. <laughs> I just have to retake a lot of tests. <laughs> um, yeah, eccentric loaded exercises are good for tendons, but it doesn't necessarily have to just be eccentric. What we've kind of moved towards is heavy, slow. Um, so one thing you can even use is a metronome um, and do a three second, three, three, three timer. So like um, think uh, patella tendon. So like in your knees, um, if you did a squat and you had a heavy weight and you went down slowly for three seconds, hold the bottom for three seconds and then come up in three seconds. Um, that gets really hard, really fast. Um, and that's a great way to challenge any tendon and kind of get your brain uh, firing too. So that's kind of where we're leaning more than just eccentrics. The guide to choosing trail runners. So I did that as a presentation for um, a PCT group. Um, I guess you could technically join that group. It's Yogi, um, Yogi's PCT group, PCT 2023 planning, um, trip reports or something like that. There's like a parenthesis by it, but you want the one that's like ran by Yogi. And then she has all the zooms I've done for them in that group. And so there's one on trail runners, one on just training, and then a more in depth one on injuries. One question I have, and I've seen a lot of people with like cork balls or using like a Nalgene water bottle to roll it out. What's, what's your thoughts on kind of rolling out muscles? Is there a ther therapeutic effect up for doing it? Yeah. So when it comes to rolling out muscles, I think the biggest misconception is rolling out is not a sufficient warm up. Um, so like when you go to the gym, sometimes people will roll out and then just go straight into heavy exercise. Um, rolling out has its place in terms of increasing blood flow, kind of getting uh, the nerves and the muscle to calm down in an area like a local effect, um, but it's always best followed with some kind of movement. 
Um, so when you're hiking, there is a ton of movement already happening. So that piece is definitely covered. So just using it as a supplement to do the calm down thing. Um, great at lunch, great at the end of the day, and typically feels really good on the feet, especially. Um, and I, I tend to prefer the cork balls in part because full disclosure, I really support Merrick and Raji, um, the cork ball company, just like a great company to support in general, um, great people. And, but the cork ball is light and like a very effective little tool. So. And if people want to view some, like the slideshow again, we'll be putting it up on our YouTube because I know a lot of people weren't able to make it tonight. <clears throat> yeah, that'd be perfect. Um, and actually, if you are able to send me the link, I was going to put um, sure. a page and I was going to, I had pre-recorded, but then I figured since I was doing it live, maybe we would just record this one anyway. Okay. Um, but I can put it on a web page on my site too, along with some additional kind of related resources. So you guys have like one page for you guys to all just access this video and all those things. Oh, that'd be awesome. Thanks. That was super helpful. Oh, you're welcome. I like doing these. <laughs> So I got started on PT for hikers since I hiked in uh, 2019, and I saw a lot of people getting injured and getting off trail um, when I thought it wasn't really necessary because they were, the typical scenario would be like, go to a small town hospital with uh, insert overuse injury and be given a brace or a boot or something like that and told to take a month off, which is devastating in terms of timeline with this kind of hiking. Um, and also like not great advice. So, you know, I saw all of that and just kind of, I guess, internalized it. And then <laughs> once COVID hit, I started cooking up ideas and thought I should really put an end to that. So, um, so as far as a trail warm up, honestly, I usually just recommend starting really slow, um, because it's often really cold. So it's hard to want to just like in terms of being realistic, it's hard to want to do anything other than just get moving um, because you're freezing. So typically just starting slow once your body's warmed up, then you might stop and do, um, you know, like a little bit of ankle mobilization, some thoracic rotation, like the thread, the needle kind of thing, just sort of the, mo the motions you're not getting much while you're actually walking. Um, but I typically would just start by moving, like by hiking and then stop and do those things. So general foot pain is a little tough because it's usually a little more specific than general, but rolling it out at the, at the end of the day with the ball is helpful and managing swelling is really important. So like getting your feet elevated um, I have a couple videos on swelling on YouTube, but um, just getting your feet like above your heart um, on your brakes can help go a long way in terms of taking off some pressure in your feet and your knees. Anybody else got any last final questions here? If you'd rather chat about it rather than type it up, feel free to pop off mute too. Mm -hmm. um, cramps, so salt tablets um, or like the, the, the cramping pills, um, depends what brand you get, but those kind of things can really help if you're getting cramps in your calves. It's usually an electrolyte issue. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, when I ran a marathon, just did one marathon, just so I could say that I had did a marathon and towards the end, I had never had muscle cramps and I would drink a ton of Gatorade and water and it still wasn't enough. And they were handing out these, uh, like salt pills or the cramp pills. And I couldn't believe the difference they made. 
Um, so that made a believer out of me for sure. Um, but if you, if you get cramps, they're, they're worth carrying with you just in case. Um, but definitely make sure you're kind of looking at your electrolytes and your water intake and making sure you're getting enough of all of that. So if you're switching from a higher drop shoe to a lower drop shoe, um, you want to be making sure you're focusing on ankle mobility and eccentric calf work. So like heel raises off the edge of a step um, and then even toe raises. So like lean against the wall and lift your whole foot up so you get the front of your shin too. Um, and just doing that progressively and then slowly starting to transition. Um, there's not really a magic formula. The only real research that we have on it when switching to a lower drop suggests that like six weeks is kind of the the guided number but honestly I think that's just the only study that we really have I don't think it's like too set in stone so it's kind of just um being gradual with it maybe every other time you wear your shoes um and then just kind of going based on if you have any symptoms some people can just switch seamlessly and not have to really do any kind of um acclimatization so it kind of depends on the person but as long as you're doing full range ankle strengthening you should be fairly adaptable to swapping shoes so the advantage of a zero drop shoe the whole so the minimalist maximalist thing is shoes of, they started off um, somewhere in the middle right and then historically shoes came out and it was um, focused on having these wide minimal shoes and then your foot would get strong because it's working so hard in the shoe um, and that's not untrue um, but it also in the context of a through hike can be tricky um, because it does take a while to be strong enough that you can work and wear one of those kinds of shoes under the pressure of hiking 10 to 30 miles a day. Um, so a lot of times people will be fine with them in regular life, but then when they put that kind of load on a shoe that makes their foot work harder, um, they start to run into issues. Um, but zero drop can be beneficial for things like some knee pain. Um, it takes some of the pressure off the knee by dropping your heel, as long as your ankle has the mobility for it. Um, but then there's things like, uh, we kind of went like full swing, like the minimalist shoes came out, um, injuries kind of increased, um, slash it didn't really support the claims that some of it was meant to do with running. Like they wanted you to have a midfoot strike and that was part of it. And they found it wasn't really making a difference. So then there was this huge swing, the opposite direction. And we got things like Hoka and maximalist shoes where they're real thick on the bottom. Um, and I think it just comes down to, and that's a big thing of the, the shoe presentation is just um, the shoe has to be comfortable to you and it has to fit your specific needs. So if you have a lot of overpronation or you land on the side of your foot or you have stiffness in your ankles, a real minimalist zero drop shoe is probably not meant for you um, because we are, we're not primal anymore so we don't have like we're we sit you know and we we are stiff and we we're different bodies than we would have been in prehistoric time where maybe we could have been barefoot all the time so um, shoes are meant to accommodate where we are now as humans so if you have any of those issues that you want to pick a shoe that's going to support it so if you over pronate you want a stable shoe if you have stiff ankles you want something with a rocker bottom like hokas or you want something with a little higher drop like cascadias Super anecdotal, but I know I had a lot of patellar pain mm -hmm. and switching to a zero drop. It was a cushion shoe. It was the, the Lone Peak and then eventually the Olympus, which has quite a bit of cushioning. And I know I noticed that with a zero drop and less of a rockered sole, going downhill didn't hurt my knee because the shoe didn't want to keep rolling forward downhill. Yep. Yep, exactly. And when we train like the quad and patella tendon, we do it with the heels up. So like, like putting your heels up on like a set of dumbbells, like really getting them up and going knees over toes. 
Um, so if that's a sensitive movement for somebody and their shoes are elevating their heels, that can sometimes be problematic. All right, we'll give everybody another minute if they got any last burning questions. Morgan, want to say a huge thank you for doing this. I know you must be crazy busy. It's a crazy <laughs> year on the PCT and <laughs> it's right in the heart of start dates right now. So really appreciate you coming to talk with us tonight. Yeah, for sure. It's nice to get involved with a different trail. When you uh, messaged me, I was like, oh, well, now I have to go down the rabbit hole of the GDT and that's going to end up on my list inevitably. So <laughs> I asked so many people that I knew were like through hikers from all over the world and you were the number one physio. Everybody recommended you. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's going to be it. Um, thank you everybody that came tonight. Um, we'll have this up online. It'll probably take a couple of days, but um, keep a pe keep your eyes peeled um, where you saw the advertisement for this. We'll let you know where the video is going to go. And again, I'm just going to post your website. It's blazephysio.com if anybody has any questions. It's right there. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'll put my email as well if anybody's curious. You can always reach out to me as well. Um, <clears throat> anyway, thank you, Morgan. And thank you everyone for coming and have a good night. All right. Thank you. See you guys. <laughs> yeah.